Lord Altadice, Excellencies, High Commissioners, distinguished guests, lords and ladies, Commonwealth friends. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this important event in our Commonwealth calendar. I'm pleased to see so many of you for what promises to be, as always, the most stimulating and thought-provoking evening. We also greet those throughout the Commonwealth joining us via the online video live stream. Since its inauguration, the Commonwealth Lecture has been delivered by a wide range of eminent individuals, men and women distinguished in many different spheres of public life, including last year, Helen Clark, Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme and former Prime Minister of New Zealand. The first lecture back in 1998 was delivered by Professor Amartya Sen, a winner of the Nobel Prize for Economic Science. A great champion of the Commonwealth, Professor Sen went on to chair the Commonwealth Commission on Respect and understanding. Lord Alderdice was also a member of that commission and contributed greatly to its work. And he has many other highly significant initiatives of peace building and conflict resolution. We are honored that he has kindly agreed to be chair for a discussion with questions and answers following the lecture this evening. The report of the Commission on Respect and Understanding, Civil Paths to Peace, which he was holding in his hand just now, was issued in 2007. It continues to be an immensely important Commonwealth contribution to global wisdom and international thought leadership, particularly in the contemporary global context and its necessity is being emphasized every passing year. The Commission report and Amartya Sen himself made much of solutions based on the multiple identities of each individual. This approach is of particular significance to the important topic being addressed this evening by a very distinguished lecturer, Irina Bakova, Director General of UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Building on our new 2016 theme, an inclusive Commonwealth, Director General Bakova will speak on education, educating for inclusion, dialogue and peace. No one could be more qualified to do so. As the first woman to head UNESCO, Irena is a leading international advocate for ensuring that there is quality education for all. This includes being a champion of gender equality, and she has made this a personal priority in UNESCO's work globally, and you will find the card on each chair in this hall more about her. Cooperation between UNESCO and the Commonwealth is increasing apace. And we are working in closer collaboration and partnership towards shared goals of respect and understanding and for inclusiveness in education. Irina, we are honored and deeply grateful to you for generously agreeing to be our 2016 Commonwealth Lecturer. You are most warmly welcome and I invite you to address us.
dear, dear Kamalesh uh, and um, uh, Lord Older Dice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very honored to be here for this 18th Commonwealth Lecture. And first and foremost, thank you for the very kind uh, uh, presentation uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it is indeed a big honor after so many illustrious speakers and, and people who are sharing, I believe, the same value, the same passion for mutual understanding, for dialogue, for tolerance, for peace and for sustainable development. Let me, ladies and gentlemen, say that I do believe there is nothing like the Commonwealth of Nations in the range of its members, in the diversity of cultures it brings together, in the values it carries forward. The Commonwealth chapter, Charter adopted in 2012 makes clear that the special th strength of the Commonwealth lies in the combination of diversity and shared inheritance in language, culture, and the rule of law. These ideas resonate powerfully with UNESCO, whose constitution was adopted 70 years ago, on 16th November 1945, here in London, not far away, at the Institute of Civil Engineering, where the conference, the Constituent Conference, was presided by Miss Ellen Wilkinson, United Kingdom Minister of Education at the time. UNESCO and the Commonwealth are guided, I believe, by similar principles of dialogue, respect, tolerance, understanding, cooperation, joint action, and something that I do believe, Kamalesh, we just uh, shared with you uh, as a passion and as a conviction, and I'm talking about new humanism. The Commonwealth, for us, for UNESCO, holds a special importance. Inside the organization, the Commonwealth group of member states is dynamic, constantly generating new ideas for which I'm deeply grateful. And our cooperation was formalized in 1980. But I do believe, and we are working, it's time to renew it. Our partnership covers a wide horizon with a focus on education, on teachers, on technical and vocational training, on higher education, open educational resources, science, and of course, mutual understanding and tolerance. Let me highlight the importance of our joint action with the Commonwealth of Learning in countries across the world. Last March, you Secretary General Ambassador Sharma gave an inspiring lecture to the UNESCO Executive Board on the issue of empowering youth. This is, I believe, an excellent transition to the theme I wish to explore with you, educating for inclusion, dialogue and peace, linked also to the 2016 theme of an inclusive Commonwealth. Earlier this month, in this very building, the world came together for the London 2016 Syria conference, which I was also honored to attend. For the first time, the international community addressed the comprehensive impact of the crisis on education at all levels inside Syria and host countries. And I would like to commend the United Kingdom for this initiative. I believe this is absolutely vital. Inside Syria today, there are 2.1 million children and youth out of school, out of a total of 5.4 million. In five major host countries, we estimate there are 700,000 Syrian children and youth out of school. This is 50% of all the Syrian children refugees. And I believe the danger is quite clear. It is to lose a generation to despair poverty and flight. It is to lose millions of young women and men to the terrors of war, to the lure of violent extremism. This is my first message this evening. Education cannot wait. It cannot wait until a crisis is over, until disaster has struck, until the dust settles. In this respect, allow me to take this opportunity also to express my deep condolences to the people and government of Fiji 
for the tragic losses suffered after tropical cyclone Winston. Education must be a priority from the top in disaster risk reduction, in humanitarian action, in peace building, because there is no stronger foundation for reconstruction and recovery for lasting peace. This, I believe, is a human rights imperative. It is a development imperative, but it is also a security imperative. I start with Syria because I believe this crisis highlights the wider stakes of education for inclusion, dialogue and peace. But we all know the world has never been so young and it is getting younger every day. You know this better than anyone. The Commonwealth includes a quarter of the world's population of which 60% are aged 25 or even younger. Young women and men today are the most educated, connected and outspoken generation the world has ever known. But at the same time, they shoulder the heaviest burden of change, of social transformation. An estimated 1.5 billion people live in fragile or conflict-affected <coughs> countries. 40% of them are young people with 28 million girls and boys out of school. Over 200 million young women and men live on less than one dollar a day. 73 million young people are unemployed. In these circumstances, I think the questions we have to ask are quite clear. How can we promote the values of inclusion, dialogue and peace? How can we lay strong foundations for just inclusive and sustainable development for all societies. Just last August, I was honored to participate in the first global forum on youth, peace and security in Amman in Jordan, initiated by His Royal Highness Crown Prince Al Hussein bin Abdullah II. A few months earlier, in April, His Royal Highness spoke before the United Nations Security Council and said, we are in a race to invest in the hearts and minds as well as the capabilities of the youth. And of course, I agree. This is a race, a race for the hearts and minds of young women and men in poor neighborhoods, in rural areas, a race for the hearts and minds of young women forced into marriages out of school, a race for the hearts and minds of young men lured by violence and extremism. This is a race to reach and teach and include every young woman and man. Humanity cannot look to a peaceful future when millions of young people are denied human rights. Lasting peace and sustainable development are unthinkable while exclusion and deep inequalities persist. We know there is no more powerful force than education to advance social inclusion, to break the vicious circle of poverty. <coughs> this idea stand, stands at the heart of the new 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, specifically Sustainable Development Goal Number 4, which UNESCO helped shape to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Inclusive education means recognizing and accepting differences across the full spectrum of learners. It means inclusive schools that are crucible of tolerance and solidarity. It means new resources, teacher training, curricular, along with new modes of assessment, new capacities. UNESCO is working with governments in every region to take this goal forward. The UNESCO International Bureau of Education has developed resources to bolster inclusion in education systems. We are supporting countries in reviewing and developing more inclusive education policies. UNESCO's action is guided by a holistic and comprehensive vision of education. This is embodied in the publication we launched 
last year, rethinking education towards a global common good, co-chaired by Amina Mohamed, the special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on post-2015 development planning, currently a Minister of Environment of Nigeria, and Professor John Morgan, UNESCO Chair at the University of Nottingham. This was drafted in the spirit of two landmark UNESCO publications on education, Learning to Be, the World of Education Today and Tomorrow, published in 1972, and Learning the Treasure Within, published exactly 20 years ago. Given the depth of transformation affecting all societies, I'm convinced we need to think big again today about education to make the most of its transformational force for equity and inclusion, for global solidarity and social mobility. And here, the new idea that UNESCO launched during the preparation of the goal number four comes into the picture. I'm talking about the global citizenship education, which is becoming our priority. And this is not about citizenship in the legal sense. It is about learning to live in a world under pressure. It is about new forms of cultural competencies, of cultural literacy, on the basis of respect and equal dignity. It is about connecting the dots between the social, economic, and environmental dimension of sustainable development. This is linked to UNESCO's leadership of the United Nations Decade on Education for Sustainable Development 2005-2014, which concluded with the UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development, organized jointly with Japan in 2014, taken forward now in UNESCO's Global Action Program on Education for sustainable development. This is why it is so important that this type of education, education for sustainable development, is inscribed on the 2030 agenda. I believe this is essential, not least, because we need to take forward the Paris Climate Change Agreement adopted at the COP21 conference last December. So, being a global citizen today calls for new ways of seeing the world, new ways of thinking and behaving. Being a global citizen means sharing the wealth of cultural and linguistic diversity as a force of renewal, belonging and innovation. This must begin as early as possible on the benches of school. This is a pillar of the Global Education First Initiative launched by the United Nations Secretary General in 2012 and led forward by UNESCO. A year later, in 2013, UNESCO held the first forum on global citizenship education with the Asia Pacific Center of Education for International Understanding in Bangkok, in Thailand. We held the second forum in January 2015 in Paris to build new partnerships for action. We have already launched a clearinghouse on global citizenship education, hosted by the Asia Pacific Center of Education for International Understanding, which is our UNESCO under the auspices of, of UNESCO, with the support of the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. Let me just say a few words about this extremely important institute, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. This is the first UNESCO institute of its kind based in New Delhi. Launched in 2012, the institute is already active across the world through its Yes Peace Network to strengthen work for global citizenship, peace building, and sustainable development, as well as through the Change Makers program to promote youth action for transformative learning for peace, development, and global citizenship. This reflects, I believe, deep core values in Indian society. As the representative of India 
to the UNESCO Executive Board, Dr. Karan Singh, a humanist, a thinker, and a great political figure, set and brought the same vision to the work of the organization. I believe it reflects also the visit last April of His Excellency Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of the Republic of India, who paid a historic visit to UNESCO, and he spoke of the importance of education and what he called a wealth that grows with giving for gender equality, for the empowerment of girls, for more inclusive and sustainable development. This, I believe, is the spirit of UNESCO's work for global citizenship education. We are currently developing resources to support policymakers to shape new curricula, to assist teachers, to promote education for peace, for human rights, interfaith and intercultural dialogue. This is, I believe, essential against the conflicts and the challenges we confront to prevent violent extremism, to counter youth radicalization. Because I deeply believe no one is born a violent extremist. Young people, unfortunately, learn to hate. We must teach them peace. I see this as a new global struggle for hearts and minds. Education is the way to disarm the processes they may lead to violent extremism by undermining prejudice, by fighting ignorance and indifference. Because we are living through turbulent times. Across the world, we see crimes against humanity perpetrated in the name of extremist ideologies. We see minorities persecuted, journalists killed, we see cultural heritage destroyed and looted in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. We see rising humanitarian and refugee crises, placing pressure on societies everywhere. Violent extremism is one of the threats tying this picture together. There is no single cause for its rise, nor is there a single trajectory that leads a young woman or man to extremist violence. What we do know is that hard power is not enough to curb this threat. We need soft power. Violent extremists promote fear, hatred and division. We must respond with education and skills for critical thinking, with opportunities for civic engagement, with competencies for dialogue across cultures. We must do everything to counter the propaganda of violent extremism. Some 60,000 accounts, Twitter accounts, support Daesh today, with an average of 1,000 followers. This campaign is high quality, multilingual, and well targeted. Its siren call is alarming strong. Today, there are more than 30,000 foreign terrorist fighters in Syria and Iraq, in Afghanistan, Libya, and Yemen. We must respond. When violent extremists say humanity is not a single community, when they say diversity is unacceptable, we must respond by showing that dialogue between cultures is the driving force of all history. This is why I went to the University of Baghdad last March to launch a new global social media campaign, Unite for Heritage, to engage young people across the world in countering hate propaganda, in strengthening the narrative of a single humanity. This is youth inclusion for dialogue and peace. This same goal guides UNESCO's action against youth radicalization on the internet, through youth engagement, through new forms of media literacy. Last September, at the invitation of the President of the United States, Barack Obama, I spoke on the importance of education at the Leaders' Summit on countering ISIL and violent extremism on the margin of the General Assembly session in New York. And I do recall the strong words of the United Kingdom Prime Minister, David Cameron, who said, we have to go where extremism starts. We have to go at the benches of school. We have to prevent it from happening 
and not go after. In November, UNESCO held the first ever global conference of ministers of education on education to prevent violent extremism. As I'm trying to outline, we're leading the struggle on the ground. In Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, UNESCO is investing in education for young internally displaced persons and refugees. In the NetMet Youth Project, with the support of the European Union, UNESCO is supporting the civic engagement and inclusion of young women and men in 10 countries around the Mediterranean. All of this is part of UNESCO's contribution to the implementation of the United Nations Secretary General Plan of Action to prevent violent extremism. Education is a central plank in this struggle. Education for inclusion, education for the empowerment of every boy and girl, especially every girl and young women. In 2000, the world committed to achieve universal primary education and gender parity in education by 2015. There has been tremendous progress, but we are far from the mark. Only 60% of countries have achieved parity in primary education and only 38% in secondary. UNESCO's new e-atlas of gender inequality in education shows girls around the world are twice as likely as boys to remain completely excluded from education. On current trends, what UNESCO's Global Monitoring Report shows, the most disadvantaged girls in sub-Saharan Africa will only make it to school in the year 2086. The gap is wider in South and West Asia, where 80% of girls out of school will never start compared to 16% of out-of-school boys. So promoting gender equality, apart from being a global priority for UNESCO, becomes an imperative. In 2011, we launched the Better Life, Better Future initiative, working with private sector companies in Africa and Asia. And this initiative has spurred innovative alliances to empower adolescent girls and young women. I would highlight also the launch, that this launch took place in the present and jointly with Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, who has done so much to advance the education of girls and young women in her country. In similar spirit, last October, we launched the Girls' Right to Education program in Pakistan to support access improve teacher training and community action in hard to reach areas of the country. In October, I was honored to welcome His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, President of Ghana, to UNESCO, when he spoke of greater public expenditure on education, leading to a significant increase in pre-primary and primary enrollment, catalyzing progress towards gender equality. We will be making this investment case globally with President Peter Mutarika of Malawi, one of the co-conveners with UNESCO and the Prime Minister of Norway of the International Commission for the Financing of Global Education Opportunities. And I welcome the appointment of President John Dramani Mahama as co-chair of the Group of Sustainable Development Goals Advocates recently launched by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, together with the Prime Minister of Norway, Erna Solberg, to generate momentum by 2030. UNESCO, ladies and gentlemen, brings the same determination to its action with small island developing states, or as we call them at UNESCO, the big ocean sustainable states, because UNESCO is one of the champions of the SITS through our Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission through the many programs and projects and initiatives that we have launched. And I see here also the Cyclone Winston in Fiji that shows the vulnerability all societies share, especially the SIDS, 
and the importance of education for disaster risk reduction and education for climate change and for sustainable development to build resilience in societies. Following the third international conference of small island developing states in Samoa, UNESCO is strengthening the capacities of its member states to take forward disaster risk reduction and climate change education. And I would like particularly to commend Australia and New Zealand, not only for the support of this important United Nations conference, but particularly for the support they are providing <coughs> to UNESCO. This includes country programs, for instance, in Tuvalu, and also programs that we implement in the Caribbean, in Guyana, and in other countries. This includes training partners and curriculum developments from the Caribbean countries to strengthen the disaster preparedness through education and safe school facilities. The UNESCO Sandwatch program is taken forward in more than 50 countries, most of them SIDS, to monitor changes in coastal environments and build, build resilience to climate change. With the Commonwealth, we are advancing sustainability science globally, bridging the interface between science, innovation and policy. And let me commend Malaysia, who is leading on this front through projects benefiting SIDS established within UNESCO, and also under the, I would say, enlightened guidance of Professor Zakri, who was co-chairing with me the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon Scientific Advisory Board last May when we met in Kuala Lumpur. So, ladies and gentlemen, all of these are questions uh, that UNESCO and the Commonwealth are seeking to address together. In April, I will have the pleasure of appointing the former president of Kenya, Mr. Kibaki, a special envoy of UNESCO on water, uh, on water, which is crucial, I would say, with the dimension for the SDG agen agenda and for the developing of the African continent. We would like, through this initiative, to provide young women and men with quality education and skills. We want to empower them as agents of change. We want to make the most of cultural and linguistic diversity on the basis of human rights. I see the same vision expressed in the Commonwealth Plan of Action for Youth Empowerment 2007-2015 and the UNESCO Operational Strategy of Youth that was adopted by the General Conference of UNESCO 2014-2021. Together, we have implemented many youth projects in Africa, notably, to mention just one, in Zambia, building capacity with policymakers and going to other 10 African countries. Together, we are supporting governments in leading national youth policies. Together, we are promoting youth civic engagement and democratic participation in Africa, the Arab world, in Asia. Together, we are bolstering technical and vocational education and training to provide young women and men with essential skills. Education is a basic human right, but it is also a huge transformational force for resilience, for sustainable development. It is also a security imperative for more inclusive and peaceful societies. Today, in a rapidly changing world, I believe this has never been so important. In this spirit, I wish to end with the words of a man who helped set the course of Africa's renaissance, who remains an inspiration to all of us. This man is Nelson Mandela, who said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. In his memoir, Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela wrote, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, then can be taught to love. 
for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. I believe this is the essence of new humanism. This says it all. We must educate for inclusion, dialogue, and tolerance. We need to teach solidarity, mutual respect, and peace. This is the front line of our struggle to build a more just, more peaceful, and sustainable and world and sustainable future for all. We need societies that recognize diversity as a source of strength and not as a weakness. As recently, the Prime Minister of Canada in Davos mentioned in his speech. So once again, thank you for this opportunity. And I'm, of course, uh, very much honored once again to be here for this honored lecture uh, and to be also with you, Kamalesh, and with you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I want to say something, want to say something from here or there, from here. Oh, yeah. Say something and then start. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And I have requested Lord Alderdice to say something to get you all started. <laughs> <laughs> well, Excellency Kamala Sharma, Irina, you've given us a wonderfully rich educational. Uh, challenging and a passionate lecture. Uh, uh, there are a number of things uh, that come out of it. Um, uh, but first of all, I'd like to ask the Secretary General if he might uh, respond in a, in a few words, because uh, I know that you felt very enthusiastic no. about this lecture. When I wind up this evening, I'll respond in more than a few words. <laughs> <laughs> that figures, yes. <laughs> I was very struck by a number of the things that you said, which we now have an opportunity to explore with uh, the guests here. You pointed up how we cannot wait for the crisis to be resolved before we have education grasped enthusiastically. And of course, this is one of the dilemmas that we have. The immediate very often trumps the important. And there are so many immediate problems and crises that education and indeed other important aspects of the sustainable development goals tend to get pushed down the line. So I, that was a very striking way in which you started. You also talked about hearts and minds in education. And I think there's something extremely important there. Often people think of education in terms of the minds but not of the hearts. It's, it's about passion. It's about enthusiasm. It's about how people feel. Germany was probably the most educated country in the history of the world in the 1930s. But there were strong feelings around in the country, which meant that that education wasn't used to bring peace and development, <coughs> but led to other things, which, of course, you've worked very hard to keep in front of people's minds. Excellency, you, you mentioned Civil Paths to Peace, and you're right, I, I do have a copy of it here with me. And of course, that's now almost 10 years old. The world of now is different even from the world when Civil Paths to Peace was written. It's a world of even deeper conflict. It's a world where there are even larger numbers of young people, many of whom are uncertain that even education itself brings them a future. And of course, it's a world in which social media, to which you also made reference, is an even more striking part of our world and an even more important part of education. But those who make the decisions are often thinking in a world that's almost past one of the problems uh, for military people. They live in a hierarchical structure when the world is networked. They live with an expectation that the next war will be fought on the basis of lessons learned from the last one, but actually everything's changing incredibly quickly. You pointed out a whole series of important and challenging things, but you've also talked about inclusion. 
And this is the opportunity for us to include colleagues in the audience who will also have questions that they will wish to pick up and put to you. I think there are some roving mics. And so if people, ah, the ladies with the big lollipops, one and two here. So if we can have some indications uh, that you wish to take the floor, uh, that will be wonderful. And please, if and when you do, would you give us your name and then make a relatively brief and concise contribution? Let's take a number of contributions. Can I have, here we have a, two requests at the front here. So let's bring the two microphones up. Gentleman here and I think a lady here. Um, good evening, uh, Peter Williams from the Commonwealth Consortium for Education. Uh, Mrs. Bokova, you've given us a wonderful overview of the efforts that the international community is making to address uh, different forms of extreme exclusion, um, disability, gender, uh, refugees, and so on. I wonder if you could just uh, round out the picture by saying something about another group that we often forget, and if we're talking about an inclusive uh, Commonwealth, UNESCO has really been a leader in the area of adult education and illiteracy, and one is very conscious that um, in talking about inclusion, there are very many adults who feel cut off from uh, a rapidly changing world. They feel that they're getting out of date with new technologies. They're not in touch with cultural and social movements. Could you just round out the picture, uh, adding to the many groups that you have shown are being addressed by saying just a little about what uh, we do about an aging world population and making sure that we re remember them in terms of inclusiveness. And can we take the second question as well, please? I'm Rosemary Preston from the Council for Education in the Commonwealth. Peter, your opening words were 100% what I was going to say. <laughs> so my plea was, where does the complex, multiple systems of learning for adults fit in a scenario that prioritizes children without taking account of what adults need to know to be able to circulate this communication. And I think the one point I'd like to pick up is, you say extremism begins on the school benches. I think that's perhaps a moot point because it's learned in society. It's debated and discussed in adult communities. It's from there that it goes down the age ranges and is seized by younger age groups. So we have to say countering it has to be at all levels of society and it has to be anticipatory before it is, leads to mobilized action. And that, I welcome a comment. <laughs> Would you like to take those two questions? Yes, I, um, I think these are very important questions and uh, I do agree that sometimes uh, it's forgotten or um, forgotten to the extent that, uh, of course, uh, we speak about uh, children, we speak about uh, primary education, but we tend to forget that uh, dropouts of school and the secondary education uh, on one side. Uh, on the other side, uh, all these 58 million children still not in school, they are growing and they are joining this uh, army of uh, 800 million illiterate people in the world. And because of the poor quality of education, our global monitoring report two years ago showed that uh, 250 million uh, uh, young people, because they're young people, who have been through formal education for four years, they do not know how to write and read. I'm not talking about uh, anything more. So this army of illiterate people uh, because of poor quality education is, uh, is growing. So what UNESCO uh, was doing, and I think it is very important because we, are, we were the leaders of the uh, uh, United Nations Decade for Literacy, which ended two years ago, and our general conference in last uh, November adopted a new strategy. In fact, tomorrow in, uh, in Paris, we have an expert meeting uh, on how to move forward with this strategy. 
Uh, I think one of the reasons that we include it into the uh, goal number four of the Sustainable Development Goals, lifelong learning was pre in quality education, was precisely for that reason. On one side, we have to bring quality education if we want to decrease illiteracy. And on the other side, we have to give second chance to all these people at different stages in their life. Uh, they're not all adults. There are many young, very young people who have dropped out. This is where informal education comes. UNESCO has been working, opening community learning centers. We have hundreds of community centers in different parts of the world where we give second chance to people to get literacy, to be literate. We combine them with some skills nowadays, skills development so that, and I have visited many such uh, community learning centers in Africa, in Timor-Leste, in many other parts, but also focusing with the very targeted programs for literacy. Let me say that our biggest literacy program still is in Afghanistan. We are in the third phase of this uh, program. Uh, we have uh, already uh, given um, literacy to 400,000 uh, people and we target another 200,000. It is our biggest program supported by Japan and Germany. And I will be there uh, end of May. I'm going to Afghanistan once again to see how this program uh, is going and launching some other initiatives with uh, uh, President Ghani. But in this program, we target particularly women. And I think this is very important. And that is why when I say that education is security imperative, I think this is precisely one of those examples when we see education and education of girls is indeed a security imperative. Thank you very much indeed. We have now an opportunity for two more. So down at the back and a gentleman here. Uh, thank you, Director General, for the very, very informative uh, presentation that you made. I'm Joel Ngeng, I'm from the Cameroon High Commission. Uh, my question is not actually to you, it's to the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Um, I'm uh, struck by the fact that uh, the theme of this lecture is education. And we know that when we were drafting our strategic plan, the actual strategic plan, there was a big debate in the Commonwealth about the place or the role or the importance of, the, of education within the work of the Commonwealth. And I would like to, to know why the Secretary General or the management has chosen this team and how, why is it so important that you will bring the Director General of UNESCO to speak to us. Because people are thinking that maybe education as a policy issue is not as important as it used to be in the Commonwealth. And uh, maybe as in your last, you say your last uh, Commonwealth <laughs> lecture, you've chosen this one. Uh, I don't know if you can say something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a question down at the back here. Is it on? Um, my name is Dr. Rogers Okot Uma. I once was in the Commonwealth Secretariat more than a decade ago. Um, it's an elegant lecture exposition that uh, the Director General of UNESCO has given. Now, um, one thing sticks in my mind. I have an imagery, for example, of um, a group of young people growing up in their formative years, living in an environment of internal belligerency amongst the various communities. And of course, one or two things derive from that. One of these is that, uh, that uh, some of them spend, spend time in that kind of environment for almost, for almost half or more than, more than half a generation. 
in the end, the affective domain becomes very crucial. Many theories in, in education and so on in the past came into being from conditions and environments that are quite normal. As, as UNESCO moves towards trying to find a kind of education that would be uh, suitable for that kind of people, I wonder what type of strategies uh, that uh, UNESCO has in mind. And then the second, the second thing... Can, can, can you keep it very tight? Yes, because we're, yes, please. We're losing our time. Yes, just one more thing that there are those perpetrators themselves of the instability in those environments. Would they need some kind of continued personal education and development uh, to enable the environment to improve? Thank you. I'm going to take two more questions at this stage so that we get some in. Uh, gentlemen at the back, uh, gentlemen at the front here, but please do try to keep them very tight if, if you would. And I think there's also, do I see a lady at the back? So let's take those three and then we'll come to our colleagues here. Gentlemen here, gentlemen here, lady at the back. Uh, Mrs. Bokova, gentlemen, thank you very much. My name is Dejan Mikhailov. I'm a graduate student at University of Cambridge. Director General, thank you very much for those eloquent words. I have um, two questions. Um, first of all, uh, how does uh, UNESCO uh, and the Commonwealth uh, the, the, uh, does UNESCO and the Commonwealth have a course of action for reducing social inequality and poverty in first world countries? And also, I, I very much welcome the promotion of uh, equality through education, uh, but how, how, do you, um, how do you intend to secure uh, the human resources needed for uh, educational revolution in the small island states or, as you said, in Syria or in Afghanistan? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen here. Thank you. <clears throat> Ranjiv Gunawardner, uh, my question is based upon uh, something to do with the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm part of a think tank we are starting to create in the House of Parliament in relation to social mobility through education. So what I want to find out is that do you have any programs for Europe in terms of things you're involved in? Because we hear a lot about uh, emerging economies elsewhere, Africa and Asia. Is there things that you're doing in Europe? Because we are trying to get some ideas from yourselves to create an all parliamentary group so that we can have something called social mobility through higher education. Thank you very much. And the lady right at the very back. Good evening and thank you to all the speakers. Um, my name's Chimechi Allen. I um, work for a publisher that produces educational resources, um, specializes in multicultural, multilingual resources. I had a question about the figures, um, I noted that you mentioned uh, skills in critical thinking, competency in cu cross-cultural dialogue, and opportunities for civil engagement. But I wondered also whether it actually just, just comes down to poverty in a lot of cases. Are there programs to do with um, employment engagement rather than just the civil side and the cultural side? Thank you. Thank you very much. Kirin, can we come to you? Yes, I, I would uh, um, just like oh, to, yes, I, I think some of, the, um, some of the questions overlap uh, to the extent that uh, I believe, uh, and if you allow me uh, to, to come back um, to what uh, Lord Alder Dye said at the beginning about hearts and minds. I think uh, some of the questions were very much linked to what uh, uh, I believe is also the essence of education for global citizens, uh, citizenship, and what I believe education uh, should, uh, should serve as a common public good. Uh, it is about values. Uh, it is about um, uh, young people uh, learning uh, not just to read and write, and this is where I would say the heart comes into the picture, but it is also about certain values. Um, uh, it is so important uh, nowadays uh, when we speak about intercultural competencies um, or uh, the way uh, we respect each other and tolerance and respect for human rights and human dignity. I think it is very important when we speak about quality of education, we do not speak only about connectivity, about the use of uh, internet or uh, some competencies, but we speak really about, uh, about values. 
Uh, and uh, I, I do remember uh, when I went to Iraq last time and I met with Prime Minister uh, Abadi and, uh, uh, and of course it was uh, after uh, Daesh looted uh, the Museum of Mosul, it was a year and a half ago and uh, uh, all this extremism, it was just the beginning of us uh, looking uh, uh, shocked by what is happening and, um, and I went and I said, but Prime Minister, uh, you have here really a serious problem. I know that you want to reconcile, launch the, a new dialogue of national reconciliation. And I said, uh, what can we do in order to accompany this process? Maybe we could do something. Um, and he said, you know, you have helped a lot because in Iraq we have a lot of, uh, of uh, projects. We work in higher education, in universities. Uh, we, we work in STEM education. We work in water management and some others. But, and he said, you helped us a lot. But what is lacking in our schools, it's social sciences, it's values. Uh, we don't know our history. It has been eliminated from our textbooks. Young people do not that we are a very diverse society. They do not know where we come from. And that is why they, these young people, they do not respect this common history, these layers of civilization uh, that is there. So please, help us bring back this into our education system. So I think this is very, very important uh, nowadays that we really turn a little bit more when we speak about quality education, we, we learn, we, we turn our attention to this side. And this is so much linked also to peace, to extremism and to everything that we want to instill in young people. Um, uh, and, and it is also, I believe, uh, uh, coming to the critical thinking. And I think critical thinking is very much in need. The other side, of course, is uh, how Education brings about social inclusion, inequalities, uh, as you asked me, social mobility. I do believe that uh, educational opportunities is probably one of the best ways to achieve social mobility. And that is why we insist so much on education as a public good. That is why we have inscribed in the goal number four that sufficient resources from the public, partnerships are very important, of course, and we want the private sector to be closely engaged with education because public sector brings a lot of innovation, new technologies, open educational resources and others, but still the role of governments is critical. And there we have included the provision to have between 4 and 6% of national budgets allocated to education. Of course, we know that there are countries we need much, much more than that because of the, I would say, scarce, scarce resources. But it is vital that education is seen also as a vehicle for social inclusion and also of social mobility. So equal opportunities is vital, I think, if you want to see it from, from this optics, from this lens. But in order uh, to indeed have it seen this way, of course, we need to look at resources. We know teachers in Africa, there is a need uh, for... Uh, uh, already for three uh, uh, million teachers if we want to achieve uh, the current sustainable development goals. Before we were speaking of 1.5 because it was the Millennium Development Goals. Now, of course, it is much more. We need training. We have uh, in Addis Ababa our uh, uh, center institute for teacher training in Africa. And uh, now we are revitalizing once again it in order to be, we have the teachers task force that is hosted by us at UNESCO, International Teacher Task Force, working with partners. So all these elements are, are extremely, extremely important. But what is needed, uh, uh, in my view, when we speak about, uh, uh, and of course, they, you ask me about employment, this is where skills, technical vocational training, it is one of the targets in the goal number four. And we are having increasingly programs working with the International Labour Organization, with OECD, we have a, a fantastic projects uh, supported by the Republic of Korea for Africa. Just a couple of days ago, uh, I was informed that we will enlarge this project, the support from uh, the Republic of Korea. I think these are the things that we need nowadays to empower young people. Just only reading and writing is not enough, including in the informal education. We need to empower people so that they join uh, the workforce in their countries. And we know in the MENA region, for example, in the, in the uh, uh, Arab countries around the Mediterranean, I think one of the biggest challenges, take Tunisia. 
uh, they have a wonderful uh, or good quality higher education, but they lack almost all the technical vocational training. So there are hundreds of thousands of young people who are unemployed. There is a need for skilled workers, but they do not have the skills. So it is a huge, I think, necessity for having the different layers of education and to create a more, I would say, elaborate, complex and um, targeted education systems for the different countries. This is where I think if we put education on the global political agenda, we will have more economic growth, more inclusive societies, gender equality we will be improved. We will have also better, I would say, uh, we will care better about our environment. And what is most important in my view, and I'm speaking as a UN agency, and our, our, our task should be prevention and resilience. We have to, pre to be engaged in prevention when we speak about uh, maybe radicalization or, or some of the others and create resilient societies. If we can do this, I think we will do justice and accompany governments now in their quest for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much. Secretary General, there was also a specific yeah. question to yourself. Thank you for that question. There was a phase when we went through a complete overhaul of reform and renewal, a complete overhaul of, if you like, the organizational business model. When I took over as SG, it was clear to me it was an obsolete model, particularly for a modestly funded and a modestly staffed organization. And I have some of these silly lines which I try and promote. And one of them was, don't be cast down by your income. Be lifted up by the outcome which you can bring. There was never any question of our investing less in education than we've ever had, and we haven't done it. But you have to ask the question, whether in a contemporary world you were getting the returns which you need. So that was the phase we went through. It was misinterpreted frequently by under-emphasizing the social sector in favor of God knows what. That was never the intention. So now we have things like uh, Commonwealth Connects. It's a platform in a hundred communities of practice from some civil society in the Commonwealth are on it. We made that available. We have Commonwealth Class which connects the age group, which you've never done before, because I felt that in today's world, you have to do it in seven and 14, 100,000 schools are connected. And I got a letter from a school in Cape Town, which began, Secretary General, bless you, bless you, bless you. Because now we have online products, which is given in the word uh, she used, the principle was dignity and a global connection to our school, which is actually in a very depressed area, which is full of crime and full of drugs. They found a lot of dignity in themselves. So that exercise which we were doing was actually to, to, to make our, the, the Commonwealth uh, more contemporary, and we worked through, through partners. And there's no question that education is the medium through which we need to do it. It's also connected with our youth program to make it holistic and coherent all around. We had four regional centers for decades. We just closed them down, four of them. And we do, do things in a very different way now. We are world leaders in having a youth development index. We are world leaders in creating professionalization as a discipline in youth work. That's the contemporary way to work. If you want to add value, it has to be a, according to the demographic profile, which you have inside the Commonwealth. And there's, a, and there's a cultural revolution. There's a lot of assumptions we make about ourselves are simply wrong. That wisdom comes through passage of time. That information and knowledge comes through passage of time. None of this is true. We have to address young minds in a radically different way. You could not do it with the old business model. So when we were going through that process, there was an interpretation that actually we are underplaying. I wasn't doing that. My only uh, goal was, in fact, 
to get the eyes of our young people lit up as to what we were doing, both on the youth side and the education side and in the social sector. And I'm glad you pointed out that getting Irina here to speak, there couldn't be a better evidence that I meant it than to invite her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I I'm, I'm afraid the time has run away with us, folks, uh, which I think simply represents the enthusiasm uh, of all of you who've been listening to this uh, marvelous lecture. If I might just say by way of closure from my point of view, I'm very struck by your emphasis on the importance of values. There has been a tendency at times, understandably, to think about education in instrumental terms. It's all simply about acquiring skills and technical abilities and increasing employability. All very important things. But you're emphasizing the question of values because we weren't tonight, you weren't tonight, none of us tonight, we're simply looking at education. It was education about inclusion, dialogue and peace. And I do think that sometimes we forget about the purposes of some of these international organizations. You mentioned history. It was mentioned earlier on that UNESCO and indeed the UN were formed very close to this spot. And why were they formed? They were formed after one and then a second horrible world war. And the first principle in the charter of the UN is that it is there to make peace to try to make sure we don't have another horrible war. And so I was a little disappointed when I saw the SDGs, actually. 17 of them. Number 17 is about implementation. Every one of the rest is absolutely marvelous. But dealing with violence only appears as one of three issues in SDG 16. Not the first, not the seventh, not the 15th but one out of three issues, and it's all violence. Everything from domestic violence to what's happening in Syria. So I was encouraged by the fact that you brought us back to the question of the, the fundamental political purpose of education. It's not simply the utilitarian one. It is about values. It is about including everyone. It is about dialogue, and it is about peace. And so I want to thank you very much indeed, not just for the generality of the lecture and the specific issues you raised, but that you have emphasized this important human dimension to things without which much is lost. So I want to thank you very much indeed. And I know that the Secretary General wants to take an opportunity to thank you more fully. Secretary General. Thank you, Irina, for that compelling address to Lord Alderdice, for having chaired the question and answer session. I strongly agree with you, and I'm certain that everyone here in this room concurs that education remains one of the most powerful means we have in promoting the values of diversity, respect, and tolerance. Furthermore, there can be no sustainable development without education, as you just now emphasized. And universal education is only possible with complete inclusivity. Our two organizations have long shared a commitment to education, cultural diversity, and the creation of inclusive, tolerant societies. These priorities take on a new importance on, as the international community comes to grips with the challenge of violent extremism. We will now collaborate even more closely to strengthen education systems, support youth development, and extend our work on fostering peace building and dialogue. We have already concluded a memorandum of understanding to which you alluded which is now undergoing formal process of ratification. And it will be one of the earliest acts of my successor, Patricia Scotland, sitting here. And I welcome her particularly to conclude that with you in Paris, after the process of ratification on your side is over. Commonwealth peace building work 
continues to be guided by our landmark report of the Commonwealth Commission on Respect and Understanding Civil Paths to Peace, which provides practical direction on preventing violence, dismantling grievances, and building safer and more inclusive societies. Lord Alderdice quite rightly mentioned that every year brings a new situation that surrounds you. And even in the last 10 years, the world that the report is addressing has changed radically. This emphasizes the importance for our creating conclusions, products, initiatives out of the reports that we make fairly quickly. We are in a simultaneously globalizing world, a compacting world, and a colliding world as well. And there's no organization in a better position to shift the debate on the right side of the spectrum than the Commonwealth. By including and respecting everybody, the Commonwealth builds on a rich heritage of celebrating diversity. In the words of our Commonwealth Charter, we accept that diversity and understanding, the richness of our multiple identities are fundamental to the Commonwealth's principles and approach. I hope it gladdens your heart to see that that key term and principle of multiple identity is now embedded in the Charter of the Commonwealth. Safety and security are important conditions for the development of strong, cohesive, and stable communities, which is why Commonwealth leaders made provision at the meeting in Malta last November for the establishment of a unit focused on countering radicalization and violent extremism. This unit will strengthen the Commonwealth's national, regional, and global approaches to prevent violent extremism and promote peaceful societies through civil society networks, education, and empowering young people as positive actors, respecting the richness of their identities and growing a new humanism, which is a call of the times. The Commonwealth very much looks forward to partnering with UNESCO in this area. You yourself mentioned, Irena, as you came in, the long history of cooperation we already have through the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver. Investing in young people is essential for securing our collective future. We are currently running a pilot program to equip teachers with a new curriculum, knowledge and confidence, which will educate students about the importance of human rights and how it applies to everyday life. Through another program, which I alluded to just now, Commonwealth Class, we also provide online resources and activities for school children at an impressionable age of seven to 14 throughout the Commonwealth to explore in partnership with others the values of the Commonwealth Charter. 100,000 schools, as I said, are already connected on it. And these are positive steps towards more peaceful and inclusive society. We're particularly mindful of making the work of our education ministers' conferences every three years also contemporary and rich in content. A Commonwealth Education Hub, which was part of the reform and renewal I alluded to, is providing new focus with online tools and capacity for advancing inclusive education in all our member states. The range and diversity of Commonwealth membership brings particular richness to the dialogue, wisdom, and practical knowledge that can be shared in this way. Both UNESCO and the Commonwealth are firmly committed to dialogue and knowledge sharing as a pathway to global sustainable development 
and society is living in harmony, peace, mutual respect and understanding among all. The reasons for this commitment are clear. United, we stand to achieve better human development for all. Divided, our most vulnerable communities will be ever more isolated and insecure. As we now conclude the formal part of this evening's proceedings, all of you present, and thank you for taking out the time uh, and encouraging us in this way, all are invited to join us for refreshment, a less formal conversation and discussion in the Cambridge room. As you go down, I think it's unavoidable that you find yourself in that room. Please accept my renewed thanks Irina, for sharing with us your wisdom and inspiring us afresh with a vision for positive change and practical action. You have been most generous, and I feel sure all present will wish to join me in expressing appreciation to you for being our 2016 Commonwealth Lecturer. <laughs>